You probably don't need to use Lambda layers. Lambda layers are a special packaging mechanism for AWS Lambda, and they're nothing more than sparkling zip files. Lambda layers are supposed to make it easy to create a bundle of dependencies and share them across many Lambda functions. However, as you'll see, there are a number of challenges which make that harder than it really needs to be, and ultimately your package manager can do a better job. In this video, we'll cover the upsides of Lambda layers, the downsides of Lambda layers, and a couple of edge cases you need to be on the lookout for before you add Lambda layers into your stack. Finally, we'll talk about a couple of exceptions to the rule in places where you really might need them. Let's start out busting a couple of common Lambda layer myths. The first most common Lambda layer myth I hear is that users are using layers to circumvent the 250 megabyte limit. We can see here right in the documentation that the quota for unzipped Lambda functions is 250 megabytes, and that is inclusive to all files you upload, including layers and custom runtimes. So Lambda layers won't help you beat the 250 megabyte, which applies to zip-based Lambda functions. This leads to the second myth, which is that somehow Lambda layers can help lower cold start initialization times. That's simply not true. AWS's own documentation shows that the largest contributor for latency before a function execution comes from init code. They document that pretty clearly. We've also been spending a lot of time experimenting and measuring this type of initialization. And we can very clearly see the same result. The bytes you load is the highest impact towards your cold start time. Whether or not those are living in a Lambda layer or in the function zip doesn't really matter. Now let's talk about some of the development challenges that you may run into if you're using Lambda layers. If you, like me, are writing something like TypeScript or maybe Python with type hints enabled, when you load a dependency that's coming from a layer in your local editor, in your local environment, your editor isn't going to know where that code is coming from. And that's because Lambda loads it magically into your function bundle at runtime. Technically, that's an impressive feat, but it's a real pain for me as a developer because the whole time I'm editing this code, my editor and my linter is going to complain that it can't find that module that I'm referencing code from. It certainly won't find the types. When I run a bundler or a test runner, it won't really have access to that. In a couple of cases, there's some emulators which do load Lambda layers from the, your AWS account when you're testing locally, but that's not true widely across every possible ways of testing Lambda functions locally, and certainly not something that's going to be available in your test runner or your CI system. A second challenge arises when you're running AWS Lambda in production. Lambda now has support for ARM-based processors using their Graviton chip, and you may be using an ARM-based processor in your own MacBook, so it's no surprise that you may want to try out an ARM processor in Lambda. Lambda layers, like Lambda functions, also have a compatible architectures and a compatible runtime flag. However, these flags are optional, and they're not actually enforced anywhere. So it's completely possible to compile a binary for, say, x86, and then accidentally attach it to an ARM function, and that function can crash. I'll show you what this looks like. In this example, we'll look at a simple Node18 function running on x86. We can test and run this function successfully as is, but watch what happens when I add an ARM-based extension layer to this Lambda function. We can scroll to the bottom of the Lambda function console page and click the Add a Layer button. Then we can specify the ARN for an ARM-based extension. We can see right away that the architecture for our function is x86, However, the compatible architectures flag for this extension is set to ARM64. However, nothing in the UI, nothing in CloudFormation, nothing in the CLI prevents me from saving and adding that extension. In fact, it tells me it successfully updated this function. But watch what happens when I click test. Because this layer contains a binary compiled for a totally different architecture, it's unable to be executed on an x86 chip. And although this was completely preventable, nothing stopped us from crashing our Lambda function. And this leads me to my next point, which is that Lambda layers are kind of tricky to deploy and run at scale. Lambda layers don't adhere to semantic versioning. They use a incremental immutable version number for each published version. So when I'm ready to update a dependency, maybe upgrade to a new breaking change with a different version of a library, I just hit the create button to create a new version of my layer and Guess what? It's just layer version 2 now. Furthermore, because Lambda layers are runtime agnostic and cover a number of use cases, they don't actually contain a lock file or have any way for you to know what's in them when you first use them. If you're a solo developer and you're publishing them yourself, this is probably really easy to keep straight in your head. However, if you're collaborating with a bunch of other people that may be using different versions of different dependencies between different functions, this can be really hard to keep straight. 
So let's go back to my earlier example where I'm editing code or a dependency from a Lambda layer. Now, let's say I've upgraded this dependency to a new breaking version with a new API, and I need to update my function. I can just go in here and grab the new import, my code new, and then I can update my function, right? My code new. And I can just deploy this and it'll work, right? Not exactly. As I've already written about, the update function and update function configuration actions, which update the Lambda function code and the layers configured for a function respectively, are two separate control plane operations typically. So if your API gateway is invoking the latest version of a Lambda function and you roll out a deployment with a breaking change between your function code and your layer, there can be a little gap of time when those two are out of sync. The crux of the problem is that the API call which updates your function code is separate and asynchronous from the update function configuration API call, which changes which layers your Lambda function is using. And this is important because if your Lambda is running an API, maybe behind API Gateway, and you're invoking an unqualified function ARN, there can be a gap of time between when one of those operations completes before the other one is actually completed yet, leaving your function in a broken state. Lambda layers can also contribute to a particularly nasty bug if the code in your function zip happens to load a different version of a library that's also provided by one of the layers you're using. In this case, we have a function zip, which is depending on A at 1.0, and then we have two layers, layer one, which uses A at 2.0, and layer two, which uses A at 3.0. When your Lambda handler actually runs, AWS has to create a file system out of your layers and function code. And although this varies a little bit by runtime and maybe how you structure your code, at some point, your Lambda function is going to load one of those dependencies, and for the most part, it'll grab whatever is in the last merged layer. And if this seems a bit far-fetched, I want you to know that it can happen to you, because it happened to me. So let's talk about what Lambda layers can do for you. AWS lays out four things they can do, and two of them I sort of buy and a couple I don't. The first thing is AWS says that Lambda layers can reduce the size of your deployment packages. This is technically true, and if you're not frequently updating a dependency, or specifically you have a heavy dependency, which we'll talk about at the end, layers can sort of make sense. However, typically the slow part of building your dependencies is actually either compiling them, packaging them, or running something like ES build. And you can typically do that in a CI CD pipeline kind of for free. It kind of comes along with something like a GitLab or GitHub pipeline. AWS says that Lambda layers can help separate the core function logic from dependencies. While I think that's true, I don't really see much of a difference between the code loaded from a layer here or the code just loaded from another file locally. It's just not that different to me. The other thing Lambda layers can do for you is share dependencies across multiple functions. Now I'll get to this in a bit. And the last thing they say you can do is use Lambda layers to make your deployment size small enough such that you can actually edit your business logic inside of the Lambda console editor. I don't really recommend you spend a lot of time using this editor, although I do think Cloud9 as a standalone IDE product is a good you know, editor in the cloud sort of service or development environment in the cloud service. Uh, I just don't think you should be using the little editor that's built into Lambda itself. One exception to the rule for not using Lambda layers would be if you are compiling and building a well-documented, well-established, solid API, heavy compiled binary that you're going to use in many functions. FFmpeg or Sharp are probably the canonical examples here, but anything heavy that's pre-compiled that you can statically link and guarantee will always work in your Lambda function is probably fine to share in a layer, especially if the API is fully baked and you're not going to have to deal with the deployment problems I spoke about earlier. Along the same vein would be using a Lambda layer for a custom runtime, in this case the excellent Bref PHP project, which is available as a Lambda layer as well as a container image. The bun JavaScript runtime is also available as a Lambda layer, but as you can see here, the container-based version of the bun runtime is actually quite a bit faster than the Lambda layer for reasons I'll have to get into in a different video. In this case, it's probably worth it to use a Lambda layer if it's powering an extension that lets you do these things you couldn't do otherwise. In a few cases, it can be worth it to use Lambda layers, specifically for deploying and sharing heavy pre-compiled binaries or using Lambda extensions. However, Lambda layers shouldn't be used to replace your native runtime package manager, which can already detect collisions, resolve them, and prevent you from dealing with some of the issues that Lambda layers can create. 
when AWS adds semantic versioning or package metadata or lock files, so I know if my Lambda layer is gonna be compatible with my Lambda function at all times, I'd happily revisit this video. If you like this video, please like and subscribe and don't hesitate to reach out on Twitter with any questions you might have. Thanks, I'll catch you in the next one.